Ryan. I'm the City Council President. Viewers can watch the Council meeting live on YouTube by visiting boston.gov slash citycouncil-tv. I'd like to ask my colleagues and those in the audience to please silence their phones and electronic devices. Thank you. I'd like to please ask my colleagues and those in the audience to be respectful of each other. I'd also like to ask that we do not disrupt the meeting. Um, and if people are disruptive in the audience, you'll be asked to leave. And if you fail to comply, you will be escorted out. According to City Council rules, there are no signs allowed in the chamber. Mr. Clerk, will you please call the roll to ascertain the presence of a quorum? Councillor Arroyo. Present. Councillor Baker. Councillor Buck. Present. Councillor Braden. Present. Councillor Coletta. Councillor Fernandez Anderson. Council Fernandez Anderson. Council Flaherty. Yeah. Council Flynn. Here. Yeah. Council Lara. Council Louis Jean. Here. Councilor Mejia. Yeah. Councilor Murphy. Yeah. And Council Worrell. A quorum is present. I have been informed by the clerk that a quorum is present. This week's clergy is Reverend Art Gordon from St. John's Missionary Baptist Church, invited by Council, Councilor Louis Jean. <clears throat> Councilor Louis Jean, would you like to come to the podium at this time and introduce our clergy for today? Thank you, President Flynn. Um, I want to thank Reverend Art Gordon for being here today. I want to apologize to him because I promised him some Haitian food in exchange for his prayer, and I forgot that. But I'll get you on the on the second time around. And I also was like, you know, give me your bio. And he said, all that people need to know is that I'm from Georgia and I love people. Um, both of the, those things are true, but I, I think that he is meritorious of me reading uh, this brief bio about what who he is um, and how he contributes to our city. So Reverend Art Gordon is a fifth generation pastor from Georgia. After receiving his Bachelor of Arts degree in history from Savannah State University, he attended Boston University School of Theology. As a student, he was a vice president of the Student Association, a recipient of the Donald A. Wells Prize for Preaching, and inducted into the Student Honor Society after graduating with a Master's in Divinity. In 2017, Reverend Gordon was selected as the youngest pastor in the history of the St. John Missionary Baptist Church in Roxbury. He recently celebrated his fifth year of pastor ministry to the Roxbury community. Reverend Gordon served as the Roxbury neighborhood captain for Spark Boston in 2016 to 2017. He's a new leaders council fellow and a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. He also works as a senior advisor for Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, formerly of this chamber, where he leads on community engagement and stakeholder management. He is married to Portia Franklin Gordon and father to Jackson Gordon. If you have not had the opportunity to hear him preach, I really encourage you to make it out to St. John. His um, gift is palpable and obvious to everyone who has the uh, blessing to hear his word. And he's also really funny. So he, um, you know, there's a lot of jokes in there. So thank you, Reverend Gordon, for blessing us today, this morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Counselor Rupzi, and to all. Uh, Whatever your posture is for prayer, I would invite you to join me. Oh God, we give thanks for this new day that you have made. And we give thanks for an opportunity to live in this world. We thank you for this great city of Boston, its rich history, its culture, and its traditions. And we give you thanks for the work we are doing today to make its future even better. We are here today, God, because we want to see this city become a better city. And we're here because we envision that purpose. We envision a city that no matter your socioeconomic status, that every person has the ability to afford and buy a home. We envision a city where no matter your background or the language you speak, that everywhere you go is accessible to you. We envision a city 
where violence is usurped by love, by hope, and by justice. Give us the strength and the power to continue to work in such a way that makes this city a better place. Help us not to forget the homeless, the hungry, the tired, the worn, the abused, the lost. Help us to keep those in our minds as we work together hand in hand to make this city better. We ask that you bless us to do that work each and every day, for we know that you are with us. Bless us in this meeting today. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. At this time, if you're able, um, please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Reverend Gordon, for those inspiring words. Thank you for the important work you do in our city. Mr. Clerk, please um, let the record be reflected that Councilor Baker and Councilor Coletter are present. Approval of the minutes. Now we're on to the approval of the <coughs> first order is the approval of the minutes, which is uh, seeing and hearing no Seeing and hearing no discussion on the matter, the chair moves to approve the minutes from the last meeting. All those in favor of approving the minutes from the last meeting say aye. All opposed say nay. Thank you. The, the minutes of the last meeting stand as approved. <coughs> Reports of public officers and others. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 1389, please. Docket number 1389. Notice was received from the city clerk in accordance with Chapter 6 of the Ordinances of 1979 relative to action taken by the Mayor on papers acted upon by the City Council at its meeting of October 31st, 2022. Thank you. Uh, docket 1389 will be placed on file. Mr. Clerk, please read Docket 1390. Docket number 1390. Communication was received from the City Clerk transmitting a communication from the Boston Landmarks Commission for a city council action on the designation of the petition number 259.17, the Bond Hampton House, 88 Lambert Avenue, Roxbury, Mass. In effect, after December 1st, 2022, if not acted upon. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Baker, the chair of the Committee on Pl Planning, Transportation, Development. Councilor Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm moving to suspend past Docket 1390 today. On October 25th, 2022, the Boston Landmark Commission voted unanimously to, de to designate the Bond Hampton House located at 88 Lambert Ave in Roxbury as a landmark under the provisions of Chapter 772 of the Acts of 1975. Uh, in no action, if no action is taken by the City Council before December 1st, 2022, the Bond Hampton House will automatically become a landmark. Therefore, I'm seeking seeking suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 1390. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilor Baker. Councilor ba Baker seeks suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 1390. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read Docket 1391. Docket number 1391. Communication was received from the Office of Black Male Advancement of the report entitled The State of Black Males in Boston. Thank you. Docket 1391, 1391 will be placed on file. Mr. Clerk, can you please um, ensure the record is reflected that Councilor Fernandez Anderson is present? Matters recently heard for possible action. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0634. Docket number 0634. Order for a hearing to discuss the creation of a civilian construction details program. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Bork. Councilor Bork, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, we had this hearing on Monday out at the bowling building, and I wanted to thank uh, the BPS and bowling building staff for enabling that, and IGR for helping to coordinate. 
Um, and special thanks to our central staff, uh, Megan, Candace, and Ethan, um, for a, a lot of work setting up um, out there. Uh, we were there because elections was in the chamber, but I think it just underscored um, that it is it is challenging having offsite hearings, and so really grateful to the council staff. Um, we, I was joined there by my colleagues, Councillor Murphy, Councillor Louis Jen, Councillor Baker, Councillor Mejia, um, yourself, President Flynn, Councillor Fernandez Anderson, and Councillor Arroyo, and of course um, by Councillor Lara, who is the sponsor of the um, of the matter. Uh, we were joined by the administration, Chief of Streets Yasha Franklin Hodge. BPD, Superintendent Eddings, and um, Captain Hamilton. Uh, they were the administration panel, and then there was also an advocate panel, um, Families for Justice as Healing, the Boston Cyclist <coughs> Union, uh, and many other um, coalition members who both wrote in and gave public testimony. Um, there were a number of counselor uh, info requests that came out of that, so I just wanted to flag for everybody that we're in the process of collating those into a formal um, information request, and we'll be sending it over to the department. Um, the, I think, you know, as, as folks know, um, we had to recess the hearing uh, for a while um, because uh, the, we couldn't get the floor seated back. And so I just want to underscore um, that I think, you know, no matter how heated everybody feels about any particular issue, um, we have to be able to have public hearings where uh, people speak at the mic and then when they're asked to seat the mic, seat the microphone to the next person. We had dozens of people testifying on Monday, um, so that was a challenge. Uh, but um, this is a very active matter. I think that one of the things that we discussed, Mr. President, is that while there were a lot of policy conversations about the details, a lot of the actual um, details on the details are in the police contract, and so I think it will continue to relate to further conversation um, that our committee is having about the contract and relates to the negotiations that are ongoing at the bargaining table today. Um, so I expect to have further action on, like, on this front. But for now, Mr. President, we just ask to keep it in committee. Thank you. Thank you. Docket 0634 will remain in committee. Motions, orders, and resolutions. Um, Assistant Clerk, please read Docket 1392. Docket 1392, Councillor Flynn offered the following, an ordinance amending the City of Boston Code related to close capturing of public facing televisions. Thank you. Um, the Chair recognizes Councillor Flynn. Councillor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you. Oops. Thank, thank you, Councillor Braden. Council Braden, may I add um, Council Louis Jen as an original co-sponsor? Seeing no objection, you may be at, uh, Council Louis Jen may be added. Thank you, Council Braden. This is an ordinance that I filed in partnership with the Disability Commission of the Mayor's Office to address how we can ensure public-facing televisions provide closed captioning for persons with certain disabilities so that we can expand communication access through public-facing televisions and ensure that persons with disabilities have full access to information and resources shared to the public. I filed a hearing order last year and earlier this year on this issue because this was one of the issues that impacted many people with disabilities across the city. As you know, televisions in public places have often played an important role in conveying information to the public. They broadcast press conferences from public officials, breaking news, public health updates, and other critical programming that provides information and resources to residents. Unfortunately, many of these public-facing televisions do not enable closed captioning and therefore are not accessible to persons who are deaf and hard of hearing or who have hearing loss due to age or illness, developmental disabilities, sensory disabilities. To reduce this barrier, businesses can enable the closed captions function on their TVs so that a live transcript of the program's audio content is shown. Having a visible caption that eliminates a significant communication obstacle for persons with hearing loss and other disabilities. And it would also increase access to information for the general public as well. So this ordinance would require public-facing TVs such as the ones in restaurants and bars 
to enable closed captioning. This is a simple step to ensure that everyone will be able to understand the information given on public televisions. It is my hope, working with Councilor Louis Jean as well, but it's our hope that we can have an expedited hearing um, on this and, and get it passed. It is, it is my goal, or it is everyone, everyone's goal, maybe, to try to have this passed before the end of the year. Um, thank you, Councilor Braden, and looking forward to working with all of my colleagues and I know they've been strong supporters for persons with disabilities across our city, so looking forward to working again with our colleagues and with um, the original co-sponsor as well, Councillor Louis Jean. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brady. Uh, the chair recognizes Councillor Louis Jean. Thank you. I mean, I want to thank um, the President for bringing this uh, important issue to the fore. It's something that I've heard about. Um, from constituents, um, it's something that I care deeply about just as a person, um, as a chair of the Civil Rights Committee, I think it's vitally important that we provide and require closed captioning. Myself, um, I want closed captioning um, uh, on, on TVs for at restaurants and bars because it's often really even hard to hear what's happening. So closed captioning is vitally important to deaf, hard of hearing, uh, those with loss, uh, with hearing loss due to age or illness, developmental disabilities, sensory disabilities, non-native English speakers, and others. It's important that we make all public televisions turn on class ca closed captioning to allow individuals to fully experience the program without ever having to actually hear the audio track. When a program is closed captioned, individuals can pick up on sarcasm, understand the anger of a crowd, or understand who is talking when they're not on screen. Without closed captioning, all of this important information is lost, and those without, a, without hear, with hearing difficulties miss out. While closed captioning technology exists, it's not helpful if it's not being used. In countless restaurants, bars, waiting rooms, and the like, televisions play without closed captioning for no other reason than they weren't set up to do so. Um, I recently was out watching uh, the women's um, uh, soccer finals, and we had to you know, make sure that the bar, you know, turned on closed captioning so that we could make sure we were picking up on everything. So it's really just time that we change this behavior. Um, and I want to commend the Disabilities Commission for always um, centering the needs of uh, those who are disabled and differently abled. I was just working with them in close partnership this week on um, issues of access accessibility in our streets. Um, and it really does need to be part of the center of everything we do. Think about those who are often not centered and are excluded um, and make sure that we try to center them in all that we do. So thank you, President Flynn, for bringing this to the fore. And I look forward to working with you on this. Thank you, Councillor Luigi. And Councillor Mejia, you have the floor. Oops. <laughs> I think it's, it's working now. Thank you, Chair. So I thank um, my colleagues and also would like uh, to ask uh, President Flint to consider adding me as a third co-sponsor. I know we worked in deep partnership our, in our office um, throughout the journey on this particular issue and some of the hearings that we hosted. We also learned that one of the issues that bubble up to the top in regards to closed captioning is that when there is a state of emergency um, and information that needs to be shared needs to also be accessible to those who have Part of hearing and so as someone who's always uplifting the needs to represent all means all I'm really excited to uh, support this effort and ask my colleague to consider adding me as a third sponsor to join you alongside making it happen based on the work that we've done over the last two years on this thank you thank you Councillor Mejia Councillor Bach do you have your no okay anyone else like to speak in this matter Anyone else like to add their name? Councillor Arroyo, Councillor Bach, Councillor Coletta, Councillor Fernandez Anderson, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Lara, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Murphy, and Councillor Braden. Uh, docket 1392 will be referred to the Committee on Government Operations. Thank you. Oh, yes, Councillor Flynn. Um, Councillor Mejia as an original third, as an original co-sponsor as well. Thank you. Um, 
Councillor Mejia will be added as a third original co-sponsor. Thank you, Councillor Mejia. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Assistant Clerk, could you please read docket 1393, please? Docket 1393, Councillor Fernandez Anderson offered the following. Order for a hearing to discuss renaming the Roxbury Branch Library to Nubian Library. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Councillor Fernandez Anderson. Councillor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn, and thank you, Assistant Clerk. Um, Hopefully you're not uh, quivering there in your seats. It's not too nerve-wracking. <laughs> How's it going? Good. <laughs> Good. Um, thank you, Councillor uh, President Flynn. Uh, there has been an ongoing process of community engagement and activism led by Siddiqui Canbone, long, along with Nubian Square Coalition and Black Community Information Center, with the support of significant sectors of the community to change the name of the Lo Roxbury Library in Nubian Square uh, to the Nubian Library. Uh, both Mayor Wu and David Leonard uh, have made statements favorable to such a change, um, but as of yet, no concrete steps have been made um, or have been taken to implement the name change. In fact, recently after being led to believe that the Library Board of Trustees was the final decision maker in the name process, we came to discover that it is actually the Public Facilities Commission that has the authority to change the name. Uh, mind you, this is after months of engagement, activism, meetings, and discussions. Well, they uh, say information is power, so, um, but since learning that it is the Public Facilities Commission that ultimately makes a decision, we haven't heard anything from them either, despite a couple of inquiries. In any case, it strikes me that this process should not uh, be that difficult. Um, Dudley Square recently becoming uh, Nubian Square, and the library is the very same, same neighborhood. Um, and obviously a staple um, in the African uh, American community, the name serves to honor the African ancestry of the predominantly black community in, li in library, um, it's that the library is in, and it acts to pay tribute to those who remember a Nubian notion, a thriving black owned business for close um, to 50, I would say about, close to 50 years on 146 Dudley Street in the heart of uh, Roxbury. Um, actually, uh, also on Warren Street. <laughs> I actually used to work at um, Anubi Notions uh, when I was just 15, along with my other uh, jobs. But um, in, um, in my uh, efforts to support my family at a very young age, this small black-owned business was very supportive to um, young black teens in the hood. Um, and so shout out to Anubi Notions um, and um, all of its uh, innovators. In short, I believe this name change is a winning move. It would um, just uh, harken back to both ancient and modern history in black community and send a positive message to activists and advocates that their concerns are respected by do those in positions of power within our city. I look forward to working with everyone from the Public Facilities Commission to the mayor, um, to the council, to um, Owen office, uh, hopefully Chief Malor from ONS, um, to the people of Nubian Square to ensure that before long, Roxbury Library will be known as a Nubian Library. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Would anyone like to speak on this matter or add their name? Please raise your hand. Um, Mr. Clerk, can you please add Councillor Arroyo, Councillor Baugh, Councillor Braden, Councillor Coletta, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Louis-Jean, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Murphy, please add the chair. Docket 1393 will be referred to the Committee on City Services and Innovation Technology. Um, Assistant Clerk, can you please read Docket 1394, please? Docket 1394, Councillor Fernandez Anderson offered the following. 
order for a hearing to discuss how Boston Public Schools are addressing the needs of the parents of English language learners' students. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Council President Flynn. Um, if I may, uh, if you'd allow me to suspend the rules and add uh, Council Lujan and Councilor Mejia as original sponsors. Hearing no objection, <coughs> Council Lujan and Councilor Mejia are added. The chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Thank you, President Flynn. Um, EAL students make up to a third of the students in BPS. We all have talked about this and have worked on these issues, and I know that this is one that we all care deeply about. Um, EAL students and their parents often need more specialized assistance to help to deal with language barriers. Um, many parents of ELL parents do not speak English at a proficient level to be able to assist their children with educational process, uh, thereby supporting their academic success. Staff, um, school staff are at times ill-equipped to assist them. In addition to language barriers, many parents of ELL students have a lack of knowledge about U.S. education system, making them less likely to speak up and assert themselves. Um, many of these parents are forced to work multiple jobs. They are overworked and underpaid, leaving them without the time and energy to attend school meetings and be as engaged in their child's education as they would want to be. This state of affairs needs to be addressed. Um, I recently uh, met with some advocates and BPS um, administrative staff who um, also have, are expressing the need to be more proactive or um, intentional in how we address this need. All parents of BPS students have the right to access essential information in their preferred language of communication. Um, and so, therefore, I hope to uh, once again work with my colleagues on uh, this uh, hearing order. Um, I worked uh, for BPS for several years, whereas um, in addition to partnering with, um, as a what they call FCOC, uh, Family and Community Outreach Manager or Coordinator, whatever they call it nowadays, um, a uh, long time ago, not too long because you guys know I'm young, um, but I, at, at, in that capacity, I also uh, taught ESOL classes to these uh, to some of these parents in the parents in the uh, parent university uh, program that they have. Um, so deeply, um, am invested in this issue and looking forward to seeing how we can actually um, support or work with the administration to look at how we are allocating funds to supporting parents in learning English, again, so that they can support their child's um, academic success. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. The chair recognizes Council Louis-Jean. Council Louis-Jean, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn, and I just want to thank my colleague, Councilor Tanya Fernandez Anderson, for bringing this order, hearing order to the floor. I just think it's an incredibly important topic, and she um, highlighted the importance, why it's so important. Of course, you know, our primary responsibility and obligation is to, this, to, is to our students, We've seen um, lagging behind, especially when it comes to our English language learners. We want to make sure that we're devoting a lot of our energy there. But I also think about how um, so often the parents of um, English language learners are not able to be connected to their school communities because of language barriers, because they're out hustling at these two or three different jobs. And I think about all of the potential, missed potential of what they could fully be if um, they had more support um, at BPS, and the reason why, not to you know, overburden our schools, but um, it is a vector, it is a vector where, um, this, where parents interact with government, with the public resource, and I think that if we can be more intentional in that space to make sure that we are providing resources to parents so that they can thrive, so that they can know about better you know, job opportunities, maybe even with the city, or learn more about the um, English, uh, ESOL classes they can take for themselves. I think that would be great. My father, I mean, I wasn't, I grew up speaking both languages, pretty bilingual from a young age, but my father organized all of the parents in my elementary school who were English language learners into a parents uh, uh, association while he was hustling at all of his different jobs. And I, I just think that we need to think about how we can better support that level of um, engagement from the parents of our ELL students so that we can see them thrive. And, and we know now, and I've talked about this ad nauseum, we have an increasing um, immigrant population coming into our city from 
a bunch of different places, and I think this is the right moment for us to have this hearing and talk about it. So thank you to the sponsor for bringing this to the floor. Thank you, Councilor Wijan. The chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to my colleagues, um, particularly uh, Councilor Anderson, for uh, having the foresight to really recognize that while, yes, there's a conversation around English language learners and students, there's a very different conversation to be had around the parents who are navigating the space, right? These are two separate issues, and oftentimes when we come into this chamber, we try to mix everything all into one. But unpacking them and dedicating time to each is really strategic and smart of you. So I really do appreciate you um, bringing this to the floor. And you know, I often talk about the fact that my mom, um, you know, was undocumented for a period of time. And we think about a lot of families who are coming to this country, many recent arrivals who have interrupted education. So it's language access, but it's also their understanding of the importance of education and how um, how important it is for them to be fierce advocates for their children. You know, as the official translator for my mom, um, I got away with a lot of things, including st dropping out of school and going back because I translated for her. So whenever there was a call about me skipping school, I'd be like, blah, 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 and I would say whatever I felt I needed to say so that my mom would not know. This is an issue, and I'm sure this is an issue that still continues today. And I think that this level of investment and in really making sure that we're supporting um, English language learners and their parents is crucial in setting um, students up for success. So I really do um, look forward to hosting the hearing and more importantly, identifying what it is that we need to do to change this for our families. And I'm glad that um, BPS is in its early stages of de developing their budget because this is sounding the alarm that this needs to be a priority issue in terms of support. So thank you um, for hearing this and um, I look forward to bringing it onto the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. The chair recognizes Councilor Murphy. Council Murphy, you have the floor. Okay. Thank you, President Flynn. And thank you, Councilor Anderson for putting this forward. Um, as you know, I was an ESL teacher for many years, and, and as a parent myself, I know that parental involvement is key to children's success at school. And I know that there are resources and there are departments in BPS, but they give that language support to administration. And for several years, I was a special ed coordinator. And at the meeting, you could request translation, but there was never access for parents beforehand when the testing was going on and when the teachers wanted to have parent conferences. So I will, um, I'm looking forward to the hearing and the work ahead, but I do want to make sure we focus on making sure that these language access resources are at the classroom teacher level because it's the teachers who are day in and day out communicating with the parents. And oftentimes they'll say, well, we do that. There is an office. Your newsletter can be translated if you send it to this email. But we definitely need to make sure that when a parent needs to know if it's 10 o'clock or if it's at bus pickup or drop off. So just making sure we focus in on the teachers and the parents who are working directly and the school bus drivers with the parents, because that's who our parents communicate mostly with. So thank you for this hearing, and I look forward to the work ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Murphy. The chair recognizes Councilor Coletta. Councilor Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Council President Flynn. I just want to thank Councilor Fernandez Anderson uh, for pushing this forward and for highlighting the needs and opportunity gaps within the entire ecosystem that uplifts our ELL students. Um, we just voted on $1.3 billion within BPS. And there were initial investments in ensuring that there were family li liaisons in every single school um, and ensuring that they speak a second language. But we know that we can be doing so much more. So I just want to thank you again for your, le for your leadership. And we know that BPS has struggled to support families where English is a second language. And that has directly impacted the trajectory of those kids that live in my district. Um, and so again, c I commend you um, in your intentionality in naming all of the stakeholders in the administration, including the equity cabinet. Um, and those at BPS who are, are in that, that work as well. And I really look forward to centering parent and guardian voices in the conversation um, because it's really their perspective and lived experience that will make us do better. And I also think that we should be looking to them for leading the way. We could do the East Boston High School model where we recruit 
uh, from parents to be in these positions. So that's just an idea to put on the table, and I look forward to that hearing and look forward to talking through it with everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Council Collado. Would anyone else like to speak or add their name? Please raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, please add Council Arroyo, Council Bach, Council Braden, Council Collado, Council Flaherty, Council Lara, Council Murphy. Please add the chair. Docket. 1394 will be referred to the Committee on Education. Assistant Clerk, will you please read docket 13952, 1397, please? Docket 1395, Councillor Fernandez Anderson offered the following order requesting certain information under 17F regarding the Mayor's Office of Housing. Docket 1396, Councillor Fernandez Anderson offered the following order requesting certain information under 17F regarding Boston Public Schools. Docket 1397, Councillor Fernandez Anderson offered the following order requesting certain information under 17F regarding Boston Public Works Department. Thank you, Assistant Clerk. Um, the Chair recognizes Councillor Fernandez Anderson. Councillor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Um, Council Fernandez Anderson, would you, are you speaking on all of them at the same time? Yes, please. Okay. The chair recognizes Council Fernandez Anderson. Thank you, uh, President Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, uh, President Flynn, and thank you, um, Assistant Clerk. You're doing fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm requesting uh, 17Fs because it's imperative for that we know how our city's resources have been used who is accessing these resources, what is the race of the people accessing these resources and what percentages, what is the class background and gender of, uh, that are being impacted in order for us to move forward and acquire uh, an understanding of how our city allocates resources. We must have a concrete data that demonstrates point to by point how our city's money has been spent. Uh, we have all heard the soaring inspiring words the jargon that flows so smoothly from our tongues about equity, uh, but of course the jargon doesn't come cost a dime. Uh, capital investments and the corresponding commitment of strengthening our black and brown and our uh, people of lower socioeconomic class, uh, irrespective of their backgrounds or race, and working class communities um, of colors, of course, that such investments represent, however, um, do not come cheap. I think we all, know that we're already spending money and quite a bit of it. I want to make sure that it's being spent equitably and for that we need data. Um, some of you may remember that I filed an equity hearing um, or a hearing order on equity in the budget and I think that these uh, 17 Fs, you'll see a lot of them so I won't take much of your time um, up here or in the future. Um, it's in preparation, I think it's important for me to aggregate some of this data in order to properly inform uh, the hearing coming forward. Um, I look forward to working with you and hopefully you will join me in the hearing so that we can properly um, assess whether or not the city's dashboard is implementing proper tools in order to measure. Um, and I know that the point of it is to monitor um, process or, in, or progress, but how are we measuring it? where are the metrics and how do we actually ensure that if we've declared racism as a public health crisis, then how uh, are we actually leading by example? Whether it be in allocations of the budget um, through the operational budget or uh, procurements. And I know that the administration has been, put forward, been putting forth a lot of efforts in terms of accountability, um, looking at ways to create diversity, um, however, I think that across the board in our city, during the budget season, we saw how inequitable or racially inequitable uh, we are spending money in, uh, or contracting out. Um, so I look forward to getting that information. And to the administration, I think that it's important for them to, for me to acknowledge that um, this, is, this is still collaborative um, work here, uh, whether it's a 17F or I'm placing a phone call or an email to you. Um, really, it's not, you know, bringing down a gavel. I am I'm just a speck on a leaf. I am small. <laughs> and uh, I'm just here to do some work. And in full transparency, I think it looks like 
uh, this that I file and that I come on public uh, platform and I am able to say, hey look, I need this information and can we have a conversation about it? And I'm gonna prepare the information and then we're gonna have a conversation and hopefully we can all um, put our money where our mouth is. Thank you. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. Council Fernandez Anderson seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 1395. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 1395 has passed. Council Fernandez Anderson seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 1396. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 1396 has passed. Council Fernandez Anderson seeks suspension of the rules in passage of docket 1397. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 1397 has passed. We're on to personnel orders. Assistant Clerk, please read Docket 1398, please. Docket 1398, Councillor Flynn for Councillor Royal. The offers the following. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 1398. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Assistant Clerk, can you please read Docket 1399, please? Docket 1399, Councillor Flynn for Councillor Royal. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 1399. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Assistant Clerk, can you please read Docket 1400, please? Docket 1400, Councillor Flynn for Councillor Mejia. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 1400. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. We are on to late files. I, I am informed by the clerk that there are two additional late file matters. The additional late file matters include a letter of absence from Council Worrell, a resolution from Council Fernandez Anderson. The late file matters should be on everyone's desk. We will take a vote to add these items into the agenda. All those in favor of adding the late file matters into the agenda say aye. 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 Thank you. The late file matters have been added to the agenda. Um, Assistant Clerk, can you please read the first late file matter, which is the letter of, abs letter of absence from Council Orell, please. Okay. November 9, 2022. Dear President Flynn and Council colleagues, please be advised that I am unable to attend today's City Council meeting as I would be out of the state. My staff will be in attendance and I would review the tapes of the meeting when it becomes available. Thank you, Brian Worrell. Thank you. The first late file matter will be placed on file. Um, Assistant Cora, can you please read the second late file matter, which is the resolution from Council Fernandez Anderson, please? Do I see? From Councillor Tanya Fernandez Anderson and Councillor Brian Morrell, resolution to request Ward Greens to postpone all closure of Boston's location. Walgreens has recently announced that they would be closing three Boston locations in Roxbury, Mattapan, and High Park, all pre preliminary black, brown, and working class communities. And Results, Walgreens should not open any new location in Boston until they have committed to a mentioned postponement, allow them, the city and the communities to assess the impact neighborhoods properly. Therefore, the Boston City Council call upon Walgreens to postpone and propose closure of the store's location in several of Boston preliminary black, brown, and working class communities, and they should not open any new store in the city until they agree to do so. Filed on November 9, 2022. Thank, thank you, Assistant Clerk. The Chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Council President Flynn. Uh, Walgreens recently announced that it will be closing three of their locations uh, in Roxbury, Mattapan, and Hyde Park, all predominantly working class communities with majorities black and brown residents. The announcements of said closures were made in a stealth manner with insufficient time allotted for customers and workers to plan for the terminations of the establishments. These closings, problematic, um, closings are problematic in their own right. 
are particularly disturbing in light of the fact that Walgreens is doing exceptionally well. For fiscal year 2022, Walgreens has made $4.3 billion compared with $2.1 billion of FY 2021, reflecting a $2.5 billion gain in the after-tax income for the corporation. In other words, operating income at Walgreens has increased 54% over the previous fiscal year. Um, additionally, their CEO, Rosalind Brewer, made over 20 eight million dollars in total compensation this year compared to less than 17 and a half million earned by her predecessor in 2021. In comparison, many Walgreens workers make our local minimum wage of $14.25 an hour, with store managers often making just a couple of dollars an hour more than that. So for them to hide behind financial loss, um, and we understand that there's all of the issues with Mass and Cass and Nubian Square, um, with the um, untreated uh, population um, there in and out. Um, however, um, they, uh, for, for basically, while they're hiding behind the financial loss, while more than doubling their income over the previous year um, and paying the CEO more, um, also, Roxbury, Mattapan, High Park are working class communities with a lot of elderly housing. Um, my team is very thorough, y'all. I'm not going to read the whole dissertation thing today, but um, I really uh, just want to emphasize that obviously this is a big ask, but I want to have a conversation about it. It is a resolution. I want to have a conversation about it and really be able to assess how these closures are impacting our communities. We've held um, a community listening session. I've called Walgreens several times. We've sent them letters and uh, we visited uh, inspectional services, call out inspectional services several times over there. And then I compared the locations. I went to downtown in, in different areas. Um, and of course, in uh, other more affluent communities, Walgreens seems to be doing beautifully and clean and smells good and everything's doing fine and well stocked with security and staff. And so hopefully um, Walgreens will be receptive to this conversation and really understanding uh, you are making money in, in, uh, in communities of lower socioeconomic class and yet you are profiting and making a huge profit margin and increase $2.5 billion, it's a lot of money. Um, so hopefully, um, again, you guys, sorry, my council colleagues will uh, support me in this conversation uh, to really hold them accountable. It's not okay. Um, we, again, we have a lot of elderly um, senior homes in uh, Nubian Square, uh, in and around Roxbury, Mattapan, um, and everyone is just devastated and uh, not knowing what the solution will be. Uh, so we're making efforts. I'm open to suggestions from my colleagues. If you'd like to offer, um, of course, any types of services or resources that may assist in terms of transportation or uh, delivery services for pharmaceuticals, um, please, I'm, I'm open to talking so that we can assist our constituents. Thank you so much, uh, President Flynn. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? The chair recognizes Council Coletta. Council Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you, Council President Flynn, and thank you again, Councilor uh, Fernandez Anderson, for your leadership. Um, I think it's reprehensible that a major corporation is actively telling a broad swath of people, too bad, so sad, uh, when it comes to their health and wellness and putting their profits first. Um, and I vividly remember, I was, I was young at the time, everybody knows that I'm young as well, um, I remember Mayor Menino at the time telling Chick-fil-A to kick rocks when they were uh, being discriminatory towards the LGBTQ community. And so we can do this, we have leverage. And so I think that doing this will bring them to the table. And I am um, more than happy to support this resolution, so thank you. Thank you, Councilor Coletta. The chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to Councilor Anderson um, for uh, filing this resolution, I want to be, I, I want to understand if, if we're going to have a conversation like a, a hearing on this too, if that's what you're asking for, um, uh, because I do think that there is an opportunity for us here on the council to really look at how people are doing business in our city um, and what opportunities exist uh, for Walgreens to put their money where their mouth is and if they're going to shut down, how they can invest in smaller mom and pop um, 
owned pharmacies that I know there's um, Pharmacy Lux that is in Mission Hill um, area. It's owned by a Latino um, group of folks. So I think that there are opportunities for us to seize this moment to encourage Walgreens to, if they're going to shut down, how that we can reallocate some of those resources to support small minority business owners to be able to do that, as well as providing the financial resources if we're gonna set up um, delivery services to, set to, to have them pay for it. Um, because when there is a will, there is a way, and I think everybody needs to you know, pay. Uh, so we'd just like to offer that as we continue to have this conversation and I am in support of the resolution as is but am curious to know if the um, lead sponsor is considering hosting a hearing because I think it is worth a conversation um, diving in a little bit deeper uh, to figure out how we can make this happen and yeah add my name and me as a third sponsor if you want to. Thank you, Council Mejia. The Chair recognizes Council of Royal. Council Royal, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you to the makers. Uh, I have several Walgreens that are closing in neighborhoods I represent, uh, and this really speaks to uh, not just decisions made by corporations, but also uh, decisions in terms of who has health access and who doesn't have health access and how these sorts of changes really impact communities and people who rely on them to receive their prescription medications uh, and, and receive the health care support that they need. Uh, and so I think it's important that we look at how these decisions get made and we also look at preventative measures to sort of prepare in the future so that things like this don't occur again where we have sort of uh, islands where you can only get your prescription medication from one specific location uh, which creates sort of issues like this when those, when those corporations make decisions to close in very specific neighborhoods. Um, and when I say very specific neighborhoods, I represent communities of color and many of these closures are happening in communities of color. Uh, in the city of Boston, and I think that we have to really have a conversation about how corporations who make profits and dictate so much of how our seniors and people in our communities receive their medications make these kinds of decisions, what thinking goes into these kinds of decisions and the ways in which we can legally uh, try to prevent or postpone these kinds of decisions from being made in ways that impact and harm our, our community residents. So thank you, uh, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. I would also say it's worth a hearing, uh, especially if Walgreens is willing to come uh, and, and and speak and answer questions and do the things that they should do as people who do business and make money in this city. Uh, and so I would second the hearing, but if it just moves forward as a resolution, I have my name, it has my support. Thank you. Thank you, Council Royal. Would anyone else like to speak or add their name? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the chair recognized. The chair recognizes Council Louis Jen. Council Louis Jen. Thank you. you. Um, I'm not going to belabor a lot of the points were already made. I just want to thank the uh, my council colleague for this resolution. I believe when we both together at the Walgreens across from uh, the bowling building one evening, and I went in and had a really long conversation with one of the managers. Um, and, I, and I appreciate how this resolution really also highlights the plight of the workers, both in terms of how much. Uh, they've been paid oftentimes, as I was speaking to them, without getting a raise, and oftentimes how they feel like they're responsible for managing this store without any corporate support. And so I just want to highlight um, the manager that I spoke to about the issue that they're facing and about all the hard work that they've had to do. And of course, um, as everyone has also spoken to, like what happens when there's a void in the community and folks are not able to access their you know, life-saving medication, um, especially in black and brown communities like Roxbury, Mattapan, and High Park. So um, look forward to having a hearing um, and bringing them here and holding them accountable, um, but also thinking about um, what we owe to the workers who have really shown up for a community when uh, we have um, absentee corporate entities um, ha that have not been doing their part and have not been doing right by our city. So thank you. Thank you, Council Luigi. And the chair recognizes Council Lara. Council Lara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn, and thank you to the makers for putting forth this resolution. I don't care much for corporations, and I absolutely care less for corporations that come and exploit black and brown um, neighborhoods, uh, especially corporations like Walgreens. I am standing to add my name and support this resolution as is, but I have to be honest that my stance is to let them 
shut down. I don't think we need these kinds of folks doing business in our neighborhoods. One of the things that we did when I was at the Boston Public Health Commission, when we realized that we, Roxbury, didn't have access to a full service supermarket was that we went to a small mom and pop shop, which was called El Platanero, and through grants that we got from the CDC, the city and the Boston Public Health Commission gave them the resources necessary to expand and open a full service supermarket. And so if Walgreens doesn't want to serve our communities, then I say let them go. I say we put out an RFP through the Boston Public Health Commission, we go through these local pharmacies and we help them expand into these neighborhoods. You know, F off to them. But thank you for filing this resolution, and I'm happy to support it. Thank you, Council Lara. The chair recognizes Council Fernandez Anderson. Council Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Council President Flynn. Thank you um, so much for uh, my council colleagues who've uh, stood up in support. I believe that we do have enough support to pass this today. However, um, I do feel that everything is a conversation in the spirit of how we lead in democracy, uh, they're not in the room. But I mean, I, I'm in the position of don't, this is my position, obviously, this is what I'm proposing. However, I feel like there are a lot of constituents, uh, community members, and folks that want to be heard on this issue because of the way that it impacts them. So um, I continue on with uh, my original request to, to just um, send it to committee and hold a hearing. Um, and uh, definitely, yeah, I'm, I'm with you, Councillor um, Lara. Thank you so much for keeping decorum. Um, and uh, <laughs> I look forward to the hearing. Thank you uh, to everyone. And I'm sorry, uh, please uh, suspend the rules. Um, if you can please suspend the rules and add uh, Councillor Mejia as a co-sponsor as well. Uh, Councillor Mejia, that's the last time it's going to work. Smooth, not that smooth. All right? No. Jokes. Jokes. Laugh. <laughs> Mr. Quirk, um, could you add Councilor Mejia as an original co-sponsor? I got you. Would anyone else like to add the, would anyone like to add their name, please raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, please add Council of Royal, Council of Bar, Council of Braden, Council of Coletta, mm -hmm. Council Fernandez Anderson, Council Flaherty, Council Lara, Council Louis Jean, Council Mejia, please add the chair. This matter will be referred to the Committee on Small Business and Professional Licensure. We're on to green sheets. Anyone, to, anyone wishing to remove a matter from the green sheets may do so at this time. The, before I continue, um, the chair recognizes Council Mejia. Thank you. President Flynn, I um, would like, now that this is going into a hearing, would like for you to consider um, placing it in the uh, economic empowerment and labor committee because I believe some of the points that Councillor um, Anderson uh, uplifted here has to do with labor and how we treat our, our workers. And because this is really about economic empowerment, I do believe in the spirit of helping to support small mom and pop shops that we have an opportunity to expand that conversation within that space. So I'd love to ask you to consider placing this in the Economic Empowerment and um, Labor Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. I did have a discussion on this subject, but I still, I think the Small Business and Professional Licensure would be the appropriate committee. Um, we're on to green sheets. Council Baker. Um, Mr. Clerk, Council Baker would like to pull dockets 1265, 1266, 1267, 1268 from the green sheets. Mr. Um, Assistant Clerk, can you read the dockets into the record? Planning, Development, and Transportation, Docket 1257, Petition 
of wage drive you for license to operate motor vehicle carriage of passenger for hire over certain yes, streets and buildings. Which one is this? Oh. 1265, oh. 1266, and 1267 on, on page 15, and 1268 on okay. page 16. Okay, the green sheets, they're not printed all. We're in a brief recess? Yep. Yeah. We are back. We are back in session. We are back in session. Um, assistant clerk. The chair recognizes the assistant clerk on docket one two six five one two six six one two six seven and one two six eight from the green sheets. Docket 1265, City Clerk transmitting a communication from the Boston Landmarks Commission for City Council Action on a designation of the petition 274, 
1.21 Mount Calvary Holy Church Congressional Share Tapio Saikon Roxbury Mass Docket number 1265. Docket 1266, City Clerk transmission a communication from the Boston Landmarks Commission for the City Council action on designation of the petition 214.15 Blessing Sacrament Complex, Jamaica Plain, Docket 1266. Docket 1267, City Clerk transmitting a communication from the Boston Landmarks Commission for City Council action on the destination of petition 269.21 Frederick Alliant Mansion, Interior Back Bay, Mass. Docket 1267. Docket 1268, City Clerk transmitting a communication from the Boston Landmarks Commission for City Council action on the destination of petition 269.20, the Howe Kingsley House, Dorchester, Mass. Docket 1268. Thank you. Mr. Clerk, on docket 1265, 1266, docket 1267, docket 1268, can we pull the committee to properly have it before the, um, the council? The Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. Councilor Baker. Aye. Councilor Worrell. <clears throat> Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Lara, yes. and Councilor Flaherty. Yes. It's properly before the body. Um, the chair recognizes Councilor Baker on, on those four d dockets. Councilor Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to speak on all four of them together. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> uh, dockets 1265, 1266, and 1267 were unanimously approved by the Landmarks Commission on September 27th, 2022. And docket 1268 was unanimously approved by the Landmarks Commission on October 11th, 2022. All four, four were filed by the mayor on October 19th, 2022. And if no action is taken by the city council, they go into effect on November 14th, 2022. Passage of these four dockets will allow the properties to be designated as Boston Landmarks. And just so for, for people's own knowledge, docket 165, is, is 1719 Otisfield Street in Roxbury. Docket 1266 is uh, 21 Creighton Street in Jamaica Plain. Um, docket 1267, which is the Frederick Air Mansion. It's an interior um, co on Commonwealth Ave. 395 Commonwealth Ave in the Back Bay. And 1268, <clears throat> the Howe Kingsley House is, on, is at 16 Howe Street in Dorchester. Thank, Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Baker. We'll take uh, votes individually on these dockets. <clears throat> Council Baker moves for passage of docket. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, Council Bach. I didn't. I didn't see your um, light there. No. The chair recognizes Council Bach. Council Bach, you have the floor. My my apologies, Mr. President. I just wanted to say very briefly um, that we're really excited about the landmarking of the interior of the Air Mansion. Um, it's uh, like this kind of very rare, incredible thing where Tiffany, the jewelry company, did the interior of the whole house. Um, and when the property went up for sale a couple of years ago, there was considerable concern that because only the exterior was landmarked, um, that that interior could just be lost. Um, and so a lot of folks sort of rallied and had, and actually ultimately it was sold to someone who wants to keep it anyways, but in the process of that, the idea of preserving this um, interior was born and so just really excited about it and also just wanted to express gratitude to the Landmarks Commission for obviously Councilor Baker's been moving a lot of these and that's because they with the additional staffing that we got for them have been really accelerating the pace of finishing study reports and making these recommendations um, and although I just spoke to the one that's in my district it's um, very gratifying to see them be all over the city and in everyone's districts because I think that was part of what the council was aiming for with funding that. Thank you Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Bach. Uh, Councilor Baker moves for passage of docket 1265. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. That docket has passed. Councilor Baker moves for passage of docket 1266. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. That docket has passed. Councilor Baker moves for passage of docket 1267. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. That docket has passed. Council Baker moves for passage of docket 1268. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. 
um, that docket has passed. We're on to the consent agenda. I have been informed by the clerk that there are okay, there are no additions uh, to the consent agenda. The chair moves for adoption of the consent agenda as presented. All those in favor say aye. aye. Thank you. The consent agenda has been adopted. Memorials. Today we'll adjourn our meeting in memory of the following individuals. For Councillor Bach, Hester Fuller. For Council Braden, Francis Keedy, John O'Brien. For Council Coletta, Ruth Gorman. For the Chair, Winnie Zhu. For the Chair and Council Laura, jo Joseph Antonuccio. For a Councilor Louis Jen, Ruth Allen. Benjamin, Edwin Pizarro, Kisnick Ball, for Councillor Murphy, Teresa Terry Ryan, for Councillor Worrell, Herman Max Halton, Jasmine Burrell, Sandra, Por Sandra Porter. A moment of silence, please. The chair moves that when the council adjourns today, it does so in those mentioned. We are now scheduled to meet again in the INL chamber on Wednesday, November 30th at 12 noon. Before we adjourn, I want to say thank you to the city clerk's team. I want to say thank you to the city council central staff. I want to say thank you to my colleagues and the public. All in favor of adjournment, please say aye. 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 The council is adjourned. <laughs>